Developing new clinical guidelines can be a real challenge. This is especially so when your new clinical guidelines need to integrate pre-existing clinical guidelines. My name is Jeffrey Franck. I'm a statistician and the CEO of STAT59. Today, we're going to have a chance to sit down and speak with Eric Weinstein about his most recent publication on new guidelines in spinal mobilization restriction. Okay, so Eric, thank you very much for agreeing to be with me here today. So Eric, you are an emergency physician, you are a graduate and now faculty at a master's degree in disaster medicine, researcher in disaster medicine, and associate journal editor as well. Does that uh, pretty much cover it? Well, actually, I'm the deputy editor of the disaster medicine and public health preparedness. Uh, okay. It's more of an administrative, uh, the way the articles come in to the managing editor, they go to the deputy editor, and then they go to the associate editor, to the reviewers, back to associate editor, the deputy editor, and then uh, a decision's rendered. So, Eric, today I wanted to talk about your most recent publication, which just came out last week in pre-hospital and disaster medicine, which is a T2 translational science modified Delphi study, spinal motion restriction in a resource scarce environment. Uh, maybe we'll just start by having you tell us what's important about this study. Well, the concept of spinal immobilization or spinal motion restriction has evolved over time. Some of this is driven by the legal implications or the threat of lawsuit more so than the science which has evolved over the last 15 to 20 years that there really isn't spinal immobilization. There might be spinal restriction. And there's been some good studies, the Nexus study and the Canadian spinal rules um, have shown with good data and it's been reinforced by further studies that patients really don't need to be immobilized uh, for the majority of the time. If they're up ambulatory after a motor vehicle crash and saying, oh, my neck hurts and they're freely moving their head, they don't need to be uh, placed on a spine board and driven to the hospital and stay on that board for 45 minutes to an hour and then eventually get taken off the board and now they're stiff and sore and then you get the x-rays and it's these studies are showing you really don't even need the x-rays. So this has been hard to adopt, difficult to adopt in resource rich environments. Some cities, some states, their medical control has looked at this and really have taken not the state of the art but where the science is to limit the use of spine uh, spinal immobilization or long boards and collars then you move that to the resource scarce environment countries where there isn't uh, viable or or reasonable ems where there's a mass casualty incident and there aren't enough boards there aren't enough collars also in different environments, conflict zones, complex humanitarian events, or even long transport times. So resource scarce environments, which patients really need to be immobilized? Which patients really need to be restricted? It's not really immobilization, and that was one of the questions that we asked is, do you agree, what is your, your thoughts about uh, spinal resource, uh, sorry, spinal motion restriction as opposed to spinal immobilization. There was a paper that came out uh, from two professional societies of, of note that then became somewhat of a guidance, I don't wanna say standard of care, but, or a gold standard, but this became then the, the way to go. But there were some, some holes in that, we thought, particularly for the resource scarce environment. Um, the World Associated Disaster and Emergency Medicine Congress in Toronto in 2017, we convened a, um, a workshop, a roundtable workshop, led by my co-author, Joe Cuthbertson from Perth, Australia. And we just put it out there to the audience. And what, what, what are the issues that you see in your, in your setting? And that's resource scarce environments, long transport times. And uh, there was a, a contrast and, and conflicts and, and gaps between what was published and what wasn't published. And they asked the board, Joe being on the board and myself being on the board at that time, to create a white paper. So we went to the board and they said, well, is there something better than a white paper? We really need science behind this. So hence the study is born. 
So Eric, when we're trying to develop practice guidelines, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about this. And your team chose a rather, I think rather unique methodology for how you went about this. And I wonder if you could just explain to us a little bit about what that methodology was and why you chose that. As we've grown accustomed in medicine, we're, we're bound. And I think some of this is because of science and some of this is because of uh, consistency for nothing else to use consensus guidelines, to use clinical guidelines that are developed by some sort of experts. Some of them are, uh, these guidelines are developed by professional societies of questionable methodology. In other words, you have a table and people get around the table, but now it's by Zoom conference, but you're, you're around a table and the experts, because they're members of the professional society, um, speak of their experience, they speak of their knowledge, they speak of their research, and they come to a consensus. And sometimes this consensus is of uh, concern because you have dynamic personalities or positions of authority that command acquiescence of other panel members due to competing interests or partisanship. Right, right. You have uh, person A that's the leader. And if you want to use the gelateria example that you so often use in your discussions of statistical methodology, this family has been making gelato forever. They have tax stamps to prove it. They are the family. This is the gelato maker expert. This is the guy. Then you have another guy that's his friend and you need to be nice to this guy because you want to be included in the next round of scientific uh, study. So you want to you acquiesce to them. So in the end, there's the big dog at the table and they get their way and people agree. Um, people come to these consensus meetings with their own agenda, which might be contrary or diverting somewhat from the issue at hand. And there's also a lack of diversity of factual opinion. So why the Delphi method? There's also the grade methodology, which uh, is also a consensus by experts that's used. But then you look at it and say, well, how did they still get to it? What was the science behind the arrival at their level of evidence? So in our opinion, the Delphi was the way to go. And this comes from the late 50s, studying weapon systems. Um, in the RAND Corporation, it's now evolved in the last five to seven years to be the way to go as far as a methodology to arrive at a scientific best, still it's experts, still it's expert opinion, but it's the best way in our opinion how to do this. And, and the beauty of, of working in this methodology, and we did a modified Delphi, the first round uh, we, we talked about before the 2017 Wadham Congress, in 2019 it was in Brisbane. So we had another workshop where we had a very structured interview, again, with people that had an interest, whether they were experts or not, they still had interest. They had their own experiences. Why not call them experts? Um, they may or may not have published. They may or not be instructors. They may or not be uh, researchers in the field, but they came. They were our focus group. We had a very structured, uh, open-ended question and answer session and we created 10 statements um, from this session, and we used 10 statements from the um, article I, we talked about earlier by Fisher, and we created 20 statements. So that, that then became our, our first round of the Delphi. Then we went into the actual Delphi, and uh, where do you get your experts? So what we used were um, the experts that were authors in a systematic literature review that I talked about Joe Cuthbertson from Australia. He uh, was a lead author. We published in pre-hospital disaster medicine a systematic literature review of this exact subject. So we took those authors from the articles from those publications that met criteria and we contacted them. Then we also looked at leaders in the field. Again, subjective, you could say. But uh, you'd have a hard time to quarrel against these people. There may be others, but we did contact others uh, that we felt that didn't publish um, in the field, but they were educators or that they are known to be um, actual practitioners in these environments, and they became our expert panel. The background information for the systematic literature review um, were, was provided to the participants, and that we felt was an important part of the Delphi methodology. And the thing is about Delphi, 
there's no consensus. There's, again, experts. There's no, this is how you have to do a Delphi. This is the way to go cookbook, like the Prisma, the, the Prisma Systematic Literature Review. You have to do it this way. The Delphi, it's still open. And I think, though, it's, it's becoming more or less accepted. And we used a ranking system, a seven-point linear nu numeric scale for our statements. We, we gave 20 statements to each of the experts, and we asked to rank them. That was round two. The number of participants, there's still no number for the Delphi, what it should be. And the STAT 59 system is wonderful for this because you can decide how many participants you want. It could be 10, 20, 100, however you need to reach your goal. And, and Jeff and the, the STAT 59 team are really good about working through this. Polling was conducted via email and the system is seamless to do that. We load, the, the authors, we load our information into the system and Jeff and his team helped us with that. And we, we load the information and then it becomes seamless. Um, the experts receive an email explaining um, the study initially. So how, how, sorry, let me go backwards. I contact each of the experts and ask them if they're interested or not. They say, yes, I'm interested. Um, some of this was via email, some of this was via teleconference. And then um, they're entered into the system. They then receive an official email notifying them um, of the study and would they like to participate, they complete a consent. Uh, there is a check and balance to make sure that there, there's a security. Each of the experts are anonymous, um, so they can, they can participate in a confidential manner, and this is maintained throughout the system. Private decisions are collected anonymously through all the rounds. So after the first round of the experts, um, they give their opinions. Um, they put this on a seven-point linear numeric scale. This goes through the STAT 59 uh, statistical analysis, and then we come out. And we had an a priori beforehand that it was going to be 0 0.8 on, on the numeric scale. And then this statement then became what we considered to be consensus, and then it was later, <laughs> it was then put into our final uh, statements. The next round, um, became the statements that there was still not consensus. And the, the participants received their score for the statement that then bounced back or that didn't reach consensus. So they could see where they sat in relation to all the other experts. So they could have the opportunity then uh, to change their mind or to rethink things through. And we also then provided our uh, systematic literature review, the, the actual articles um, that they that they could use um, to help them think things through. The number of rounds were, again, not a consensus or not a standard in the Delphi. We chose more than two until stability. And then the consensus a priori with standard deviation less than or equal to one. Um, when I mentioned that earlier. So what, what we best found working with the STAT 59 software and with Jeff and his team was that they work with us to make our Delphi, as we did a, a Delphi analysis of what the best literature is out there, how you should do a Delphi, and then that merged, uh, our, our ideas merged excellently with the system. So in this episode, we saw how Eric Weinstein and his colleagues were able to develop new practice guidelines while integrating previous practice guidelines using a Delphi study. My name is Jeffrey Frank. I'm the CEO of STAT59 and a statistician. If you are interested in seeing how the STAT59 web app can help with development of clinical guidelines for your team, please check out our website at www.stat59.com.